short while ago, members of the Monetary Policy Committee voted to hold the benchmark lending rate unchanged at 11.5% and, of course, left all of the parameters unchanged. Now, we're going to go right into our panel discussion with our guests. Uh, still with us is Bates Michael is the CEO of Financial Derivatives. Also joining us is Muda Yusuf, Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And also joining us is Lawrence Harmsey, Head of Africa Trading at Rand Merchant Bank. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time and, of course, your patience so far. But I'd like to just start uh, with uh, a general question, just your initial thoughts, uh, listening to the comments from the central bank governor. Bismarck, I'll start with you. First and foremost, three people voted to increase interest rates and six voted to maintain, to hold. So we have 33% of the nine uh, leaning towards contraction, uh, leaning towards tightening, and leaning to understand that uh, inflation could be a function of um, money supply and uh, supply shocks. Um, secondly, very quickly, the central bank governor quote, quoted copiously from the central bank act that the maintenance of the exchange rate, management of the, uh, the external reserves is the primary and core function of the central bank of Nigeria and not of any other person. So it's uh, one, there, there is no unanimity there. Two, inflation uh, is a function of supply shocks, according to him. And three, the need to understand that the exchange rate is the core responsibility of the Central Bank of Nigeria and not the Ministry of Finance. Lawrence, your initial thoughts? So what were your key takeaways? So for me, the positive things were comments around uh, stimulating offshore investment. Uh, foreign participation in the market. That is, that is very key. Uh, as, as Bismarck also said, I think the, the exchange rate is their main mandate. Um, and, and I think once, once the comfort around the exchange rate and the tradability uh, at, at market determined levels is, is back in, in full force, I think you, you, you'll start to see that stability feed into investor comfort. Uh, so the encouragement to actually bring investors back, uh, understanding that it, that it plays a big part in, in, in balancing um, foreign exchange reserves and inflows is, is what, what I really think is good to focus on. Okay, Muda, did you, any, did you find any words of comfort from the central bank governor? Yes, a few words of comfort, particularly on the challenges uh, on the supply side of the economy. Uh, he spoke extensively about uh, issues of security and the need for the government to do something and issues of the investment climate and all the bottlenecks uh, to productivity and to output in the economy. Uh, he also, of course, acknowledged that the inflationary situation we are dealing with is basically a supply side issue. So we need to deal with supply side challenges. I think that for me uh, is good. I mean, of course, these are things that we already know, but at least coming from the CBN, I think uh, we'll, this will add some impetus to the advocacy around dealing with the supply side challenges. Of course, what I didn't find very uh, comfortable uh, is, is uh, his position on the exchange rates, because this is also you know, projecting the whole economic management system as something that is not coherent, and uh, it, 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 it creates a basis for a lot of uncertainty. Because we have uh, the presidential committee on the economy, we have the economic management team, we have the finance minister, we have the central bank, you know? So there, there is, no, there is no, no coherent position on something as critical as the exchange rate. That, that gives me a, a lot of concern uh, because exchange rate policy is very central, you know, to the management of the economy, to the attraction of foreign investment, to a whole lot of things that happen in the economy. So if you have a situation where the minister is saying one thing, the CBN is saying a completely different thing, I don't think it projects uh, the economic management system in a very good light. It's something that gives me a, a lot of worry. Abisma, we talk more about inflation, but I, uh, or, or rather the exchange rate, but I'd like to continue on inflation. We do know that the supply side uh, is the biggest challenge so far. Uh, for inflation, and of course, we did hear the central bank governor call or appeal to the fiscal authorities to address the security challenges in the food belt in the northern part of the country. But I'm just wondering, 
we don't appear to be winning that fight against this new form of uh, criminality that we're seeing uh, in those areas. I'm talking about the banditry now. Even though the Central Bank governor did say that uh, he's seeing, he, he sees inflationary pressures are uh, easing in a short to medium term, at the same time saying that he's cautiously optimistic, but it still boils down to our ability to be able to tame uh, this menace that we're seeing in the food belt and in the northern part of the country. But what are your thoughts? No, I think uh, to think that <clears throat> inflation has only one major cause is a, it's a bit uh, short-sighted. There are multiple causes that are compounding themselves into what you call 17.3% inflation. And I, I, I list them out. One is funding the federal government deficit by ways and means, which is essentially printing money. Two is the money supply saturation and transmission effect into prices. Three are supply side shocks due to disruption in the supply chain. Four is the increase in the price of petrol, diesel, and kerosene, which you have nothing to do about. And five is the pass-through effect of exchange rate depreciation into manufacturers. And Muda is going to talk about that. But I do know personally that on the 1st of April, the price of flour, flour is going up to 15,000 naira a bag. It was 11,000 naira last year. And it was 8,500 two years ago. Flour is being used for bread and many other pastries and others. The cross elasticity effect is that when people can no longer buy bread, they will then begin to buy yam, gari, cassava. And the cross elasticity and substitution effect pushes up the price of other commodities. So it's not a one causal effect. It is multiple things. And then you have to deal with it with a cocktail of measures. It cannot be dealt with as just uh, security. It is not security alone. There are many things that lead to inflation. Uh, Lauren, let me come to you. Uh, Muda did mention uh, that he didn't get any uh, coherent position on the FX position on the, on the FX position of the CBN. Now we know that in the past the CBN has introduced a number of measures. The INE, creation of the INE window uh, was one, and it did seem to work. Uh, and we did see some convergence, but I know that uh, the likes of the IMF and the World Bank continue to hamper on the fact that look, it is still a problem if we have these multiple exchange rates. But like I said, we do have we we have seen some progress. But for you, looking at it from an emerging markets perspective, how this looks to investors and how we're trying to bring in uh, more FDI, FPIs. What downsides do you see ahead for us? So, so firstly, to touch, I think, on the, on the effort to, to create a more coherent policy, there is definitely positive signs coming out of, um, out of the central bank and the ministry. I think closer alignment between the two, as, as uh, Dr. Musa has touched on, is, is very key. It's, it's, we've seen statements come out that, that haven't really been backed by official policy. Um, so, so that, is, as a first step to, to investor comfort, is, is extremely important. I think, secondly, um, the fact that liquidity has to be um, at a level where investors are comfortable that they can enter and exit the market um, as they have in the past. As you say, the, the initial introduction of the INE window was immensely successful. And I don't doubt for one second that, that the central bank is very innovative. Um, so I think it's just at the moment, just various policies and various uh, external uh, factors. Uh, emerging markets have been hit hard by the, the recent events in the US, uh, uh, fear of inflation, US yields ticking quite aggressively higher. There's no money flowing into any any EM at the moment, EM is actually being sold off quite aggressively. So Nigeria is faced with that external pressure of attracting flows into a market, which flows on going into any markets at the moment. Um, so yes, liquidity is definitely key. I think uh, adequate level of market forces has to drive the rate to a level where we see uh, where, where we see investors finding value, um, and that's that's probably slightly higher than we are now. And I think it's very important that they start to clear or finish clearing the backlog first. Amuda, let me bring you in. Now, uh, while the, the CBN governor did say that um, it would continue to build on the fragile growth that we have so far and continue to deploy more uh, administrative measures, it did 
call on the federal government to find more creative ways to partner with the private sector to help build critical uh, critical infra infrastructure for for instance now we know that now more than ever that is very important we need to bring in more foreign direct uh, investment i'm just what do you have any thoughts on what we can be doing differently now perhaps we should look at the uh, ppp structures if any see how we can bring in more private sector capital Yes, of course. Uh, it's very clear to, to everyone that uh, the government doesn't have that financial capacity to deal with the huge infrastructure deficit that we have. So it's, it's a no-brainer that we need uh, the private sector support and collaboration. And I think the CBN is leading a very important initiative, the Infraco uh, initiative. It's about partnering with the private sector to deliver infrastructure. But the, the, but the reality is that the private sector can only invest in infrastructure to the extent that infrastructure is commercially viable, to the extent that it is bankable. So we take the total stock of infrastructure, what percentage of it can we describe as being bankable or commercially viable? So the, 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 the scope for private sector uh, intervention in infrastructure is still very limited to the extent mm -hmm. that the private sector be looking at profits and bankability of, uh, of, of, uh, of the investment. So this, this goes to say that the, the government has a major responsibility in infrastructure provision. Uh, there are quite a number of infrastructure uh, needs that we have that the, 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 the private sector may not be able to provide because they are not commercially viable. And when we talk about infrastructure, it's not just only about roads, we have the railway system, we have even the health infrastructure, we have the educational infrastructure. We have the infrastructure that are economic, we have those that are social. And the government has a very big role to play. And it is important that uh, the government also prioritizes its expenditure. Because the only way the government can make an impact, apart from adjusting the policy environment and also ensuring confidence of investors, is also to properly prioritize its expenditure in favor of infrastructure spending. We haven't seen much of that. You know, if you look at the structure of the budget and all of that, I still believe that infrastructure is not getting uh, the right kind of, uh, you know, priority in terms of government spending. Now, Bismarck, still on infrastructure, we do now have a new infrastructure uh, company that has been set up by the, the federal government. So I'm just wondering, what are your hopes for what this new company can do in terms of potential? Yeah, it's a, it's a good initiative, but you see, it's only part of a package. What you need to look at is what we call total factor productivity, which shows you the efficient use of capital stock in a country. Uh, total factor productivity now is, has gone from minus three to about minus six, with COVID induced and all of that. Potential GDP is also growing at a rate faster than real GDP. So you have a recessionary gap. The truth is that Fiscal uh, uh, growth is a fiscal objective. It's a fiscal responsibility. It is driven by investments. Investments are induced and incentivized by a stable exchange rate amongst other things. So whilst the Infraco is going to be doing something, it is not a substitute for having an efficiently managed exchange rate, which will encourage investments. And two, align the output from these infrastructure programs to be priced at the market. You must price power at the market. You must price those roads, those toll gates and all of that, the roads that are being uh, concessioned at the market. You must price airport facilities at the market. Then investors will come in, complement the government seed capital and will lead to a positive total factor productivity number. Right now, we are tinkering at the edges and leaving some of the major decisions that have to be made uh, you know, in, in, as a work in progress. I think we need to look at it holistically, everything together at the same time, and you will have a quantum leap, you know, a leapfrog, which will happen over a two to three year period. But you can't leave one part of it. You, can't, you, you end up with what we call partial equilibrium. We need general equilibrium. Now, Lauren, let me quickly bring you in here. We, we have uh, three minutes before we go on a quick break. 
And what signals do you think uh, for fixed income investors uh, have received today? We know that the central bank governor is very much interested in bringing in more foreign portfolio investments. We've seen yields rising steadily uh, at the fixed income market. Uh, but I'm just wondering going forward, uh, but we know that the CBN, in terms of yields, there's still the concern of debt service for the fiscal authorities. So just your thoughts on the signals that investors have received today. So I think the key signal for me would be a further commitment um, and has been touched on in infrastructure investment initiatives as well is, is further fiscal consolidation. As you mentioned, the debt service cost is quite high. Um, there is talk about removal of the fuel subsidy, which is obviously an unpopular decision, will be uh, locally. But those are the types of signals on a path to fiscal consolidation. As much as the oil price recovery has been a phenomenal green shoot for the, for the Nigerian economy, um, there is still obviously risks in this oil price recovery. It is uh, heavily leveraged on a, on a global COVID uh, recovery. Um, and as more and more waves of, of COVID hit uh, Europe, the vaccination efforts are slowing down. Um, we've seen the oil price come, come off quite aggressively in the last few sessions on the basis that, that a lot of people bought into the long. So a sustained oil price recovery or stability rather, I don't think it's necessarily about a, a one-way rally, would be a key. I think we've touched on the exchange rates multiple times, um, transparency in, on that front. Um, and then also, I think uh, we've seen a, a significant repricing in yields, but looking at regional yields, I don't think they're at a level yet where um, the risk reward metric makes sense with FX at current levels. So I would say probably a gradual further depreciation or devaluation would be a good sign. Um, so those are some of the things we'd look out for.